feel like my rage this morning has like turned down to like tiredness. Mm. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> it simmers down. It Eventually, simmers, you're just yeah. asleep in like an anger coma. <laughs> I'm so fired up right now. I feel you, guys. Before uh, we start recording, some some stuff happened uh, work related, and I am to say the least a little bit heated. But you know what? It's okay. You're still uh, employed. <laughs> <laughs> to be clear. <laughs> well, no, clearly. Yeah, 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 for sure, for sure. But, um, yeah, I'm just trying to channel my energy to this podcast. And mm-hmm. I want to, yeah, we're just going to do this. And it's going to be all right. And we're going to have fun. And that's what we're here to do. Yeah. Um, so before we get rolling. Do you want to say the welcome to? <laughs> oh, yeah, guys. Welcome to another edition of the, the Cook and the Coach podcast. I'm Beza, I'm the coach. I'm Kenny, I'm the cook. I'm really excited for the topic that uh, we're going to go into today. Uh, we have an interview with, oh, not even just, not really, I wouldn't say really interview, but a conversation with our friend Taylor, mm-hmm. um, talking about uh, an array of different topics. We kind of went off on a few tangents during that time. For you. But um, before we do that, we want to get into our segments for the week as well as some listener questions so uh without further ado uh ken do you want to do you want to start off yeah so for this week um this is kind of our first chance to discuss this since it happened um we actually recorded the episode with q and josh an hour or so um before the awful um passing of kobe and gianna and um, all the people involved in the helicopter crash in California. And yeah, I know for me, it definitely just messed me up for days, which I didn't expect. I mean, obviously it, it's a horrible tragedy, but I wasn't a huge fan of Kobe. I, I didn't, I, I always was rooting for teams that he wasn't on. Um, but then when he passed away in such a horrible manner, I just threw me for a loop, man. It really messed me up. Um, and so... Yeah, I, I was looking in, at different articles about how people were coping with it, and it was really cool to see the different art that was coming up. Um, a lot of murals, a lot of paintings. There were some cool, some people painted full basketball courts, um, sides of buildings, um, it just all sorts of really cool stuff. And yeah, it just it was insane to see the level of impact that he had on so many people, um, myself included, and I didn't even realize it until he was gone, so... Um, my condolences, like thoughts and prayers to everyone who was associated or knew any of them personally. Um, it's so rough. And, um, yeah, I don't know. One article that I saw about this that kind of made me a little, it was, it was really sweet to see. Um, I saw it a couple different places, uh, LA times and the eater LA, they both were talking about this. Um, but one of the ways that people were paying their respects to Kobe, they, um, they were visiting, this restaurant called El Camino Real Restaurant Mexican Food. And apparently this was one of Kobe's frequented spots, apparently one of his favorite spots in L.A. And he'd go there by himself, uh, maybe after practice or games, I'm not totally sure. And I, I guess sometimes with his family as well. And the articles are just saying how nice he was and how he um, was learning Spanish to connect more with the uh, Latinx fan base. And is partly just because he was uh, married to a Latina woman, um, but yeah, it, it was so cool to see how he made the effort um, speaking Spanish with the uh, the servers and everyone there. And yeah, it seems like it really made an impact and he seemed really cool with them and he'd bring his family. And yeah, so it was cool. A lot of people came out and they were eating what his favorite meal, <laughs> what he would always get, which apparently, word on the street, is that he would get carnitas with flan or flan. I don't know how to say it. but It's it flan. Flan. Yeah. Uh, it's a dessert. Um, yeah, and it's cheesy, uh, but it's true. Like, food brings people together, and it's, like, so meaningful to make food for people, especially when they're in a rough spot or, like, when they just need, like, to connect. So I thought it was really beautiful. Um, yeah. There's no cooking instructions for this one. I just wanted to just say, like, if you have a chance to cook for people or, like, share a meal with someone that you love, like, that's you should definitely do that because it's important. Yeah. My segment, uh, continuing with the the Kobe idea, and I just want you know it's just it's interesting to 
to think about Kobe's career and then think about his post career. And I think the more we think about it, and I think everyone's been echoing the sentiment throughout the sports world is that Kobe's second act was better than the first one. Because you know, we saw Kobe um, come out of high school straight to the league, and you know, he's phenomenal. I mean, for sure, the closest thing we've seen to Michael Jordan, as far as uh, an athlete goes. Um, but when it's all said and done, you know, it's way more. It's way more meaningful to see what he's done with his life post career. You know, he refocus himself to focus more on family, spend more time with his daughters, to invest more in their lives. Um, he focused focus, focus way more on um, telling stories. He put a lot of time and energy into his new passion, which was storytelling and film creating. He won Oscar for it a couple of years ago for a short film. Like two years out of the league, mm -hmm. he had already won an Oscar. It, um, ama amazing. Unbelievable. And, you know, as a coach, we... You know, especially a strength conditioning coach, but also as a coach for football, track, et cetera, et cetera. We spend so much time focusing on the game or the craft or technique or whatever it may be, whatever sport we're, we're going to. But what's even more important than that is investing to the lives of young people, um, whether it be eight-year-olds or, you know, pro athletes, college athletes, it's you know, you can spend so much time investing in the, you know, the minutiae of the games, the X's and O's, but at the end of the day, it's way more important to um, also contribute to them in a way that's going to impact them for the rest of their lives off the court, off the field, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so when so when he passed, it, you know, not that I wasn't doing it before, but it kind of helped me refocus a lot of my... Um, my attention to my athletes, you know, so not, so, you know, I'm giving me, you know, instructions and cues in the weight room, but along with that, I'm also asking, hey, you know, like, how's school going, you know, what's up with that, you know, um, do you any help in the classroom, um, you know, how's life at home, how's mom and dad doing, all that stuff, so I'm being, I'm trying to be more attentive to that kind of stuff that's going on. Um, you know, the, you know, LeBron says, you know, always puts a hashtag, you know, more than an athlete, right? And, you know, it's a catchy saying, it's a catchy phrase, but I think, you know, Kobe Seth really reminded us, like, hey, yeah, you know, athletes, you know, are just, you know, physical specimens who are performing for entertainment, but they're also human beings, too, and they have lives, and they have families, and they have dreams, they have goals, they have endeavors. So um, I think it's important to remember that. Schultz was talking in the podcast about how he hated Kobe, and I felt the same way mm -hmm. when he was playing. Right. But I remember I was watching the Christmas game um, with the Lakers versus uh, the Heat, mm -hmm. and how Kobe hit the the game winner from like the top of the three. Yeah. Over Dwayne Wade, and I just hated him so much for making that right. shot. Because you know that's that's what we do in sports. You know, we hate we love certain people, and we hate certain people. Mm -hmm. That's just how sports works. Yeah. But she also said something very interesting. He said like. Don't let don't let that get in the way of appreciating someone's greatness. Mm. And I think while Kobe was playing, I didn't truly appreciate his greatness. Maybe the last couple of years when he was like on his last legs. But for most of his career when I was watching him, I didn't really appreciate appreciate the greatness of Kobe Bryant. And um but I will say though, when I, you know, when I was older and I was able to look grasp that concept I started to appreciate him his playing more and what really I remember um you know we, we were watching Oscars that one night you know with Dave and Kari and yes, we were yelling yes. about the Oscars and we saw him win and we were all cheering for him mm. and that was the first time I was like cheering for Kobe I'm like oh wow I'm cheering for Kobe this is yeah. really weird but you know whatever he, like, it's it's almost like we got tricked into like loving him like, yeah 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 exactly <laughs> and then um I remember roughly a year or two later or even like last year I saw, um, I was watching an NBA game, and he was in, he was in the stands, and he was with his daughter, mm -hmm. and he was like talking, talking to his daughter like about like the game. You could tell they were like talking basketball, talking about you know, yeah. everything. Yeah. So I'm like, wow, that's like super, super dope. That's really, really cool. Yeah. You know, and then, 
um, you know, we after the podcast we recorded with Q and Josh. I was at home and I heard about the ca- heard about the crash, but then I heard that his daughter Gianna was with him, and I was like, I thought instantly back to that moment of watching them talk about basketball. I'm like, oh, that's that adds another layer to it, you know. That's that's crazy. But um, all that said, um, R.I.P. Kobe Bryant, one of the goats. I can, you know, it's it's just crazy to think about. You know, and I know that we're talking about this a long time after it happened, but it's still I, I still feel I think <laughs> I think everyone still there's still like a, a a sorrow in the air about it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, R.I.P. Kobe, R.I.P. Gianna, R.I.P. to everyone else in the crash too. I think we also need to remember that there were 100%. you know seven other people in that crash that passed away tragically. Brutal. Um, so prayers, thoughts out to their families. Um. Yeah, that's just crazy thing about. Um, let's switch gears. Yeah, <laughs> lighten the mood a little bit. Somehow this just keeps getting sadder. Yeah, 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 yeah. To uh, the, no, in, no. In the interview, we're crying with Taylor. So. Yeah, no, this the our convo with Taylor was a really great one. I'm glad that you know she let us into her home and yeah, um, got have some really good conversations. Um, really quick, let's do uh, a couple listener questions, then we'll get right to the to the conversation. Let's do it. Um, Will Bensing ask us, what do you think of Eminem's surprise performance at the Ox- at the Oscars? Did you watch the Oscars at all? Uh, I, I remember we texted a little bit during it. but Yeah, I saw his performance. I watched a few things from the Oscars. Mm-hmm. Um, I thought he did pretty well. Um, it was. It just seems like a weird room to perform to. Whenever you're you're sitting down in assigned seating, I just it's not conducive to a good live performance. Yeah, it was. You know what I mean? It, yeah, I felt kind of random. Almost, I mean, I get it, like his album just came out. He yeah. won an Oscar before for that song, but he yeah. never actually performed that song at the Oscars. Right. So it was his first time there. So that so that was like kind of cool. But what what was yeah. weird is like. Half the audience was like into it, and like yes. the other half was like, "What's going on?" Yeah, but they were all sitting down. Yeah, so it was like, yeah, like some people are into it, but the fact that they were all sitting down made it super awkward. Remember when we went to that Andy Mineo concert? We went to the first one. It was the first concert I've been to. Andy Mineo opened for Lecrae. That was a great show. Uh, yeah. That was a, and yeah, yeah, then yeah. later we went to, like a year or two later, we went to another show. And at Andy Bethel. Mineo was headlining at Bethel. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. And Shot to BU. The main. All modern. <laughs> what I hated about that second concert is that. You had to stay you, in your seats. You had to stay in your seats. It was like, mm. yeah, it was like theater seating. And we tried to rush the stage and have a good time. And then security pushed us back to our assigned seating. And I was like, I, 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 there's no way I can get into this show as much as I got into the first one. Right. It's impossible. I can't do it. You've confined me to this three foot radius of where I can be. <laughs> so I can't be at a concert like that. Yeah. 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 What did what, you think? Um, I mean, I mean, it was, it was all right. Yeah. Like there wasn't the, it wasn't really the performance itself that made the news. It was like the controversy surrounding it, like people just sitting down, like the look of Martin Scorsese's face when he was sleeping. <laughs> yeah. Like everyone's like, you know what I mean? Like it yeah. wasn't the performance itself that made any headlines. It was sure. like everything around it. Yeah. So, I mean, I mean, as far as the performance itself, like it was cool. I'm not, you know, whatever. All right. Yeah. Um, let's do a more question that we'll, we'll go right to the, the interview. Cool. Um, Leet Apparel, hope I'm saying that right, uh, they ask, what song would you say best sums you up? That's a big one. I don't know. That's daunting of a task for you? That's very daunting of a task. Mm. Um, lately, it's been Stupid Deep by John Bellion. That's one of my favorite songs. And there's an acoustic version where he, it's very, it's stripped down and they have some strings and a lot of vocalists mm. all singing. And it's really good. That'd probably be it right now. Um, okay. I don't know. Uh, what about you? <sighs> what song best sets me up, sums me up? So see, like, I'm trying to think of, like, 
because not it's not even necessarily the question is not asking what's your favorite song. Right. It's asking what song like best describes you. You should choose a song that you like that best describes you, because otherwise, well, yeah. there's no way to know. I would say "Freedom" by Akon is up there. Okay. As far as like songs that describe me, talks about you know, you know, longing for freedom, you know, for for yourself, you know, not like oh, like I'm a slave, or whatever, but like mm-hmm. just wanting to like experience the best in life. He also talks about like his parents moved from Africa to America and how they worked hard to have what they have and mm-hmm. try to carry that on. So I relate to that a lot. Totally. So yeah. Yeah, yeah, for sure. It's a good question. Um guys, uh thank you for listening to this podcast. We appreciate you all. Um upcoming next is our conversation with Taylor Mueller about the new Netflix di- documentary uh miss americana the documentary about taylor swift and her journey through the last couple of years with lover the album and all that we discussed a little bit of the album too um as well as a few sad conversations so please enjoy that um yeah this is me i feel like having higher ceilings helps in general with having nicer natural lighting super helps right super duper helps yeah that's gonna be the biggest thing that i'll probably miss about this apartment is gonna be the overhead or like the the high ceilings i feel that for sure because it makes everything look bigger yeah almost all of my favorite coffee shops and restaurants all have really cool really high high ceilings ceilings. yeah yeah Yeah. high ceilings are definitely something that is not as appreciated as it should be right agreed it's true agreed have you guys been to the lynn hall before it's on it's in minneapolis on lindale avenue by any chance nope the lynn hall i think i have you have i think so okay. i'm like 95 percent sure it's one of my favorite places to go and they literally their goals in terms of like how to set up a business for like a, as a cafe they have like they do th- like the morning and early afternoon they're a cafe so they'll serve pastries and like coffee and tea and then on one side they have like a bar where they have different drinks that they can make like coffee yeah. style yeah and then they have a whole bakery and like small kitchen in back and then in another corner, they have, like, a whole studio for, like, shooting, like, food content and stuff like that. I have been there before. Oh, it's so yeah, dope. It's so cool there. It's, like, so ergonomic and, like, smart. And they have really good ceilings. And they have, yeah. like, a couple it's spots. It's beautiful the in there. Mm-hmm. Oh, anyways, I think of that a lot. When I think of that <laughs> it's one of my favorites, like, design-wise. It's really fucking dope. That's hilarious. Yeah. It's, it's awesome. Wait, 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 wait. Before, we're getting way too ahead of ourselves. We have to introduce our guest. Oh, yeah. Yes, we do. <laughs> we haven't even done that. Yet. Like ten minutes, ago, we haven't even That's said who our guest was. I've just been talking and just, the, chatting. <laughs> just chatting away. Um, our guest is a good friend of ours, a good friend of the show. Um, I met her. How long like go did I meet you? Like, like two two years ago, maybe two years ago. Yeah, through a mutual friend. Uh, this is Taylor. How do you say your last name? Mueller. Mueller. Come um, on. <laughs> I don't know. But it's, Super good friend. Don't know how to say yeah. your last name. <laughs> People don't say hi, my name. I was going to say, time, you're so. used to that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> it's not first. Yeah. Um, she is a fellow Swifty. As you guys know, um, I always take Taylor Swift or Beyonce in a debate of who's the reigning queen in music. And Taylor is a fellow uh, Swift fan. So I think it's only appropriate to have her on the podcast to talk about um, yeah. the new documentary on Netflix with Taylor Swift. Uh, yeah, we're in her apartment to discuss uh, the documentary. I'm not gonna get into it at first. I want to hear you guys' thoughts on that first before I talk about it. Yeah, but um, I mean, a contrast right off the bat. So I've always enjoyed listening to some of Taylor Swift stuff, but mm-hmm. I would never. Con- you said Swifty. Yeah, yeah. I didn't even yeah, know yeah. that was a term. Oh yeah, huge term. Okay. Yeah. Huge, like <laughs> widely, widely used worldwide term. That makes sense. It's, it's really part of how I identify myself Damn. as a person. Jesus. It's a, it's basically his Instagram bio alone. Is yeah, Swifty. that is kind of true. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Use blue. <You're> so <laughs> <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> I laughed and put one of the three candles. <laughs> that smells really good, actually. Thank you. Champagne toast. Yeah. I like the smell. It's Isn't it it's nice? like it's calming. Yeah. 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 But anyway, <laughs> I didn't know Swifty was a term. Um, yes, one hundred percent. Absolutely. I listened through the Reputation album whenever it came out. I was like, two thousand seventeen. Yeah, yes. but th- that was a step for me because I okay. hadn't listened through one of her albums in a long time. All the way through, I'd heard singles, mm-hmm. and I was like, "Oh, this is really good." But I don't think I would have done it if I hadn't heard so much good stuff, especially from you about it. Yeah. Like, 
And then, yeah, so I feel like a little bit out of my depth, but I tried to prep. <laughs> Did you, you watch the documentary? So yeah, I watched the documentary and then I listened through the album. So okay. I feel Lover? Like, yes, Lover. Okay, okay good, yeah, yeah. good, good. Yeah, so I feel decent, but I okay. feel like you guys are going to be nerding out mainly for this part. Before we continue with that, your thoughts on Lover? It's not my favorite album, only because she has like reinvented herself again, which she needed to do, but... I, uh, the, the lyrics that she uses in this album are my favorite, but it's like the, the background beats and tempos are just so different than what I'm used to from her. Mm -hmm. So I'm still, I don't know. I was like, Reputation came out and she was just so like determined and like becoming a woman and showing the world who she was. Yeah. And so now she kind of like took a step back and is like. Hey, I'm chill now, and this is mm -hmm. this is me. So it's like a, it's a big jump to go from one to the next. Yeah, she was like, I want to say like a bad like Rihanna like a bad girl style, but like kind kind of leaning that way. She was one hundred percent leaning that way. And now she's like, oh yeah, like I'm a calm, like chill calm, person. collected. I'm thirty. Like, gotta bring it all back together. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, I. Lover for me. There was some really good highlights, but there was also a lot of trash songs in the album. I'm just gonna be straight up. Um, that was my first time I actually did like the IG album review. Was that album? Oh, okay. Um, some really good songs in there, but like she did the same mistakes as the last album for me, which was the singles on the singles she put out for the album were the worst songs in the album. You think so? Like, look what you made me Wait, do. What are the singles? Look so, what you made me do, yeah. It was like the one of the first singles for Reputation. Yeah. Trash song. Awful. That's my opinion. Just garb, garbage. No way. Garbage. Oh my God, this is amazing. Oh, fancy garbage. <laughs> and then, but then for Lover, um, shoot. What was the single for Lover? It was... Lover? Not that. No, no, no. 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 Good, great song. Issues with it, but good song. Um, I think Lover is one of the most beautifully lyrically written love songs. It is, but she made the she made a mistake. She started off with the piano, like in the initial recording process. Yeah. Like, no, it should be a guitar. No, bitch, give it the piano. That was great. <laughs> I was the same thing. Fuck the guitar. Get, the, no, 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 no. Yeah. I'm, but she started uh, she started her career with a guitar, and I think that's her thought process. So I get it. <sighs> Oh, and but the, the piano version sounds, sounds so much tender. better. Yeah. Yes. You Need How to Calm Down was the single. Trash. Hated that song so much. Just And it me. Made me furious. Me. I didn't like me at first, but it's grown on me a lot, and now I like it. I am still a little weird about it. It's not my favorite. It's definitely a weird song, but it's grown on me the more I listen to it. Yeah. There's other songs that I prefer and would choose to listen to. Yeah. Yeah. The more I listen to... Um, What's the song I hate? I don't remember the name of it. I have a track list here. I was going to say, I do too. I have it right in front of me. Nice. <laughs> Scroll down. Genius? Or... No. You need to calm down. No. The more I listen I to it. I iTunes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you need to calm down. <laughs> yeah. The more I listen to it, the more mad I get. <laughs> Why? Why are you putting out bad bad music out there? It's, it's an awful song. Well, the it's the, annoying. The it's so essence annoying. Essence behind the song was that everyone needs to needs to calm down because everyone was getting so uppity about people dressing the way that they wanted to, and it, like people wearing dresses and coats and capes and crowns, and it's like just let people be who they want to be. Okay. That was the essence behind it. And when you understand the essence behind it, it makes the song 100% different because okay. you see the heart behind it. It had good intentions. Okay. And I <laughs> yeah. agree that to a point. But my, my counter to that is yes. part of my thought on the documentary as well. So I'm okay. going to save okay. that thought. I'm going to put it on the shelf, as Duke would say. Shelf it. Put, it, put it on the shelf. And I'll come back to that thought. But I want to hear you guys' So you guys, so you like um, so you like Lover, but you don't love it. Is that the vibe I'm getting from you? Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. Your so thoughts on Lover? I listened to it for the first time several days ago, and I was <laughs> like literally a few days ago. Thanks for partying, but I'm sorry. Um, yeah, honestly, when did it come out? 2019. Yeah. Um, oh, last year. It came out 
over like, the summer. Over the summer. Okay, that makes sense. Over the summer, early early spring. No, August twenty third. Okay. Yeah, so I was definitely late to the party. Wow. But I so I was in a weird mood when I was listening to it, and so I knew that I was gonna like, it was it would be hard for me to like it. At yeah, one hundred percent. But when I got to so the first few songs are very like poppy and like upbeat and like yeah, kind of like like happy and a little like sassy and fun and like that kind of thing. Like, yeah, good things, but like not the mood I was in. You sure. Know? Yeah. And then Cornelia Street was the song. Oh, where I was yes. Song. So, <laughs> that's so when beautiful. I was like, okay, I think I might, this matches my mood. Yeah. I think this is, I'm going to like this. Yeah. And then after that, there was like, I was kind of into it and yeah. And then it felt like an office episode where like it starts happy and funny and then it gets a little bit sad at the very end of the episode yep. and then you get like addicted and so you want to start listening to it over again. Yep. So like I listened to, what's the first song of the album? It's, uh, um, I Forgot That You Existed. Mm. Oh, that song yes. hits different <laughs> once you've listened to the whole <laughs> album because like I was like, oh my gosh, I actually really fucking love this song now. Like yeah. I understand where it's come from a little more sonically and like it's such a nice juxtaposition oh, yeah. versus like the kind of more somber end of the album. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Let's talk about uh, the actual documentary Miss Americana, which is named after uh, the song Miss Americana and the Heartbreak Prince on the Lover album. Yeah. Uh, thoughts on the documentary? Well, so I have been following Taylor Swift since the beginning. Okay. Since Tim McGraw. Yes, since Tim McGraw. And I, I grew, so I grew up with her. I was in high school listening to her songs, like Crying About Boys. Sure. Mm-hmm. And to... Her other documentary was great, whatever. This one showed a completely different side of who she is and how much like heart and soul she puts into her music and how she creates it, which really made me feel even more connected to her than I already did. And then to see, you know, that she she felt all the things that I felt and she was even talking about how when she writes the songs like when she releases them and she sees how people connect to them she, it makes her feel really connected to her fan base and how she understands that we connect with her in the same way I thought the filming could have been better I always think about how they got the footage for yes. documentaries and I'm I'm not a huge documentary person to begin with but I just she's such a talented artist and has all these amazing things about her and the filming just didn't portray that you Mm -hmm. know like it definitely showed like some fun parts of her but i don't know do you think it might have been intentional to show like a more raw side? absolutely i think it was super intentional but like distracting yeah a little bit a little bit like i was watching it and I was super into it. And then all of a sudden I'd be like, okay, well, I'm just going to listen to it because <laughs> there's a lot happening right now. Oh, and right. so I'd take a step back and I I was like setting everything up in my apartment on Thursday and I was like watching it again. And I was like, oh, this is just a lot. Like I just need to listen. And so I just would look away for a couple minutes and just listen. Right. And I got a lot more out of it when I was just listening to it. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's probably not the effect they were going for. No, no not, oh, no, at, no, not at all. And that's and that's kind of why I was like, I don't, maybe there's just like something going on in my head, but the audio of everything, like I cried a lot Yeah. because I just felt super connected to everything mm-hmm. that she was saying. Mm-hmm. When I watch behind the scenes footage of yeah. the musicians, it's like watching, especially how they'll cut it. It's like, like you work. It's like watching a basketball game and then reducing all of it down to like the one best play of the game. The highlights, yeah. And then having one highlight from like a ton of sessions all together. And it's like, yeah. this is what playing basketball is like. Or like making music is like. Yeah. And obviously that's like when she's at the piano, like figuring out the lyrics for Lover, just like maybe my favorite part of the whole documentary. Is oh, like, yeah. God, it was so pure. It's so it was lovely so pure. and like really works well. But it's, I also know that that's not how... That's like, not how it actually she went happened. She's through so many songs. She's like, "Fuck!" <laughs> she's hitting the wrong notes. She's it's not there. Yeah. But almost without fail, every time I see a music documentary and see behind the scenes stuff, that's why I love John Bellion too, is because he has so much of him making the music, and it shows like how he made the beats and his inspiration mm-hmm. for the lyrics and stuff. Mm-hmm. Always helps me like the artists more. Yeah. yeah. So. I absolutely love the behind the scenes stuff. You know. Yeah. And the vibe I got when I talked to people about the doc was. 
everyone love the behind the scenes of how she was making music and how she was collaborating with people, but we wanted more of that. Mm-hmm. Like I feel like they could have shown so much more of her actually sure. making the music, and yeah. I feel like she only gave us like a small taste of it. Right. I want like I wanted a whole hour of just her making music. We would have been happy with that. Yeah. But no, she showed like a snippet here, a snippet there, and that's all she gave us, which was kind of disappointing, but. You know, mm-hmm. it is what it is. You can't give away all the secrets, I, I guess. Yeah, yeah, that's kind of what I was thinking. Like, she just can't give it all away because then it's, I think, song making, not an artist whatsoever, but the way that I have watched it happen through different documentaries and stuff like that, it's a very intimate process. Yeah. And so sharing, sharing that to begin with is super vulnerable. Oh, yeah, for sure. So, like, for her to even have as much as she did just it felt like a like a little gift you know yeah like here's a here's a little look <laughs> into my mind but that's all you get exactly yeah yeah um i one thing for that too i i really liked and this is actually referring back to the album a little bit too but it was really impressive to see how involved she was in the process like the, yeah she, she writes the, everything yeah. yeah but like the circle was pretty tight of how many people were involved on the project which i thought mm-hmm. was oh it's super like, small yeah like mm-hmm. only a few producers only yep. a few writers mm-hmm. And I don't know if she played all of the instruments into the that were on the track, but uh, on the album. But I, it was impressive to at least see her like strumming it out and like plunking it on the piano. Yeah. And, like, also, sure. it was crazy to hear her like prepping for performances and how clear her voice was. Like very smooth. Very cl- yeah, yeah, crystal clear and smooth and like not strained at all. And she's doing warm. I don't know. I thought that was really impressive. As my voice gets like hoarse. <laughs> <laughs> Well, like, even, I remember I seeing her. It was, <laughs> it was an inspiration. It's like more of a big mouth. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I remember seeing her, both her 1989 and her Reputation tours, and, like, being surprised, like, how well she sang. Because, like, when you think of Taylor stuff, you don't think of her, like, amazing vocals. You think of her, you know, her song lyrics. Yeah, it's, you know? her, it's her lyrics. It's, it's, like, her vibe, you know? Mm-hmm. You don't think about her voice. But I remember her on stage, like, wow, she actually, like, she has a really good voice, actually, you know? Yeah. So, yeah, it was cool to, like, see that little, like, part of her right before she went on stage. Yeah. It's like, oh, yeah, she can actually sing. Right. You know? And she's very vulnerable that, about that, too, talking, like, this is why I'm here. Like, I'm a singer-songwriter. Like, I write my stuff. I perform my stuff. Like, yeah, which is about, like, what separates her from everyone else. Like, yeah. I write my she shit. writes. She writes everything. Yeah. Yeah. Really respect that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, a lot of, a lot of biggest artists in the world can't say that. Yeah, that's you know? true. That's very true. Yeah. Um, I had one other thought. Go, uh, this go, is, go, go. This is back to the album again, but I've just remembered this. So there were there was like I think um, I might be wrong, but there were three different producer groups that kind of worked on it. So mm-hmm. there was Jack Anton Antonoff, if that's how you say his name, and then Joel Little, and then there was like a combo: Frank Dukes and then Louis uh, Louis Bell. They were like the, those were like the three groups of doing it. Yeah. And as I was listening through and like looking at Genius and stuff, I was noticing that. Like, it made sense that they were doing the different songs that they were doing. And there was yeah. like a pattern for the types of songs they were doing. So, like... Um, well, Max Martin was in there, too, but... Oh, okay. Yeah. That makes sense. Um, but, yeah, so, like, I was noticing that Jack was doing more of the pop stuff. Like, the very pop-centric type songs were mm-hmm. in there. And then Joel was doing, like, I don't know how else to say this, but, like, more of the woke songs. <laughs> so, more of the songs mm-hmm. of, like, The Man. Yeah. And, like, oh, my God, that song. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> but, I like, love every it. song that was, like, in that vibe or yeah. like, kind of that headspace, literally every single one, he was the producer on it, which I thought was kind of funny. And then Frank Dukes and uh, Lewis or whatever, they did, like, more of the, maybe a bit more hip-hop or, like, Latin-inspired stuff and, like, with the more, like... Yeah, I guess more hip hop type drums. Wow, like, you really did your research. Yeah, mm-hmm. but I was—I thought it was really interesting though because it was like they still kept the circle really tight in terms of like who was working on it. But what was making me like really confused was like how do you even with four producers plus her and you said Max Martin. Yeah. Even with them, like how do you have an overarching like sound to your album, and when you have all those different people come in. Well, I mean, I think it comes back to her, right? I guess like, so. Her, it has to be. Her writing, so. her writing the actual lyrics, I mean... Yeah. I think when she has, like, a consistent theme throughout her writing process, yeah, these different producers are going to have their own special, you know, flavors and takes. Yeah. But it's all going to sound, you know, virtually the same, have the same uh, flow throughout the album because it's her with the consistent lyrics. You yeah, know what I mean? She probably has a lot of say. She's yeah. the common denominator right. overall. 
You yeah. know, she's that the one sense. who controls everything in the end. Yeah, yeah. that's right. What would you? What were, you, what were your feelings on the first half or is the second half of the documentary? Um, what would you say? I would say. What was your response to it? I would say, to be honest, some of the issues that she was kind of like encountering don't apply to me as much, so it's harder for me to connect with it and like naturally. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So for me, I just enjoyed the first half of it more. Um, part of me is like, if you have a platform and you feel passionately about something, you should speak out about it. Mm-hmm. And then I also have like the Ricky Gervais at the Golden Globes vibe of like, you know nothing about the real world. Greatest speech of <laughs> Like time. telling celebrities oh not to like Love tell regular that. people about their lives and like yeah. tell them how to vote and stuff. So I have like those two conflicting feelings in yeah. myself. I don't know how to reconcile it. But I will say the issues she talked about seem to be really affecting her life specifically issues that she had like gone through Mm -hmm. and so and it's also has implied that she'd done a lot of research and had thought really carefully about what she's gonna say before she said it so from that perspective i'm like all right do your thing like whatever like as long as you're like being thoughtful about it sure but i don't know what did you guys think about the second half of it i again i just love her and everything she does um so hearing like the political stuff made me connect with her reasoning behind that even more because when she did come out and have those statements, I was confused because she has never been the type of person to be very vocal about that. (laughs) And that's something I've always appreciated. Um, So to see kind of her thought process behind everything, to see her fight against her team, to to stand up for what she believes in, Mm -hmm. made the world of the difference to me. If I wouldn't have seen that aspect of it, I don't think I would have... I mean, I don't think I would have agreed as much about her coming out about her political stance because it's like, sure, you're you're famous and you're whatever, but do you really need to be sharing your right. your side of things with everyone? So that was a that was a really big thing for me. When she got personal with her own personal issues, like her body image issues, um, her yeah. eating disorders, um, that was stuff that I thought was really powerful and really interesting to get her take on what she went through in her own life because I know for myself I went through a lot of body image issues when I was younger when I was mm-hmm. a kid so I really connected with that part of it um also with her talking about fame because I'm always intrigued when artists talk about fame because that's you love it it's come up on almost so every intri- episode it's so intriguing to me that's hilarious and like he, I thought it was super interesting. I was like, what do you think about the famous, the rich and famous? <laughs> I just, I think this is fascinating. Mm-hmm. Um, like, her take on it being like, yeah, I know that this isn't normal. I know that this isn't supposed to happen. Yeah. But this is my reality. Yeah. Like, what she was talking about, I was like, <sighs> like, what does that do to you psychologically? Like, she's yeah. literally, like, you see the, the shot of her walking on her, outside her apartment. And there's like a thousand people like screaming at her yeah. as she's walking through a car. And she gets the car. She's like, yeah, I know that's not normal, but that's my life. How do people find her address? That is my question. That's terrifying. Is it doxing? Do people dox her? I, I, I have no idea. No idea. And then she said that that man like broke into her apartment and slept in her bed. But she that said, is wild. But remember what, like she talked about like a joke. Like, like oh yeah, someone slept in my bed like a month ago. Like, but it was like so casual. Like it happened before or something. So invasive. So invasive. That's so, my question is like where and how I do you know ever feel safe. I like, know there's crazy people in the world, but like that's a different level of obsession. Yeah. Is breaking into someone's home, sleeping in their bed, and Well, she has three homes now. She said on the CBS and she's like, Yeah, she has three homes in like three different states. Wow. Like she rotates between the three of them. Yeah. Because like she has to. Yeah. One in Nashville, one in LA, LA and one in New York. York. Yeah. Oh, in New York. Okay, that makes sense. I mean, I don't blame her though. I don't either. I I'm a like quote unquote obsessed with her. I love everything about her. Sure. I would never ever do that. That is just like that's so invasive. Like yeah. take a picture of her when she wasn't at a show, or what do you mean? No, just like go to the place where she lives. Oh, oh, or, no. like right. find out where she's gonna be flying into yeah. and like stalk her there. Yeah, yeah. Like I get that that's some people's jobs, but that that is straight up stalking. Yeah. 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 Like it's it's disgusting. Yeah. yeah. I hate it. People get paid for it though. It's a, it's a whole industry. And that's what I'm saying. I hate it. I hate it. Yeah. Just like let them live their life. But at the same time, we see a thing of Taylor Swift on TMZ. You're gonna click on it, right? Yeah. Pops, yeah. And so as much as, as we think it's wrong, 
I'm you still indulge in it. Yeah. Right. You still oh, indulge yeah. in it. Oh, yeah. That is fair. Yeah. 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 That's tricky. Also, going to what you were saying about, like, just having to always be ready for that level. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's just so how, much. Like, how do you calibrate going from a stadium cheering for you and, like, and taking that with a grain of salt and then getting just, like, a nice compliment from a close friend, <laughs> like, one-on-one? Like, how in the yeah. world could you possibly calibrate that and like understand them each the way you should you know to add to that it's like i almost forgot like she has like a life like she has like friends right remember she was like at like a dinner like with her friend like having a glass of wine having dinner Mm -hmm. they like they were making it like the kitchen just hanging out yeah i'm like oh yeah like she has friends like yeah. she has like a she has a normal life. Yeah. Yeah. In theory. Like she has like sort a person she like texts she with, like talks yeah. with, you know what I mean? Like and it's just like yeah, I, like how do you like navigate that? I have no idea. She talked yeah. about how hard it was to be so in the public eye and how people were always looking at her and always like judging and watching everything she did and how she just wanted to like have a private life and that's why she went dark Mm -hmm. for a whole year and that's why her Mm -hmm. relationship is so private and she's like she said how much more she's enjoyed it and how nice it's been to have a break yeah and that was super interesting because a lot of famous people they don't continue after that once they get that break Mm -hmm. they just drop off and they they stay private Mm -hmm. until they turn like 50 or 60 and they're like redo album yeah. <laughs> you know yeah. like the dixie chicks are like yeah. hey what's up we haven't seen you in like 30 years but here we are We're back yeah, that's cool. <laughs> also just uh so that was the personal side of her that we're talking about mm. her like activism and like her stuff like political stuff she was doing mm-hmm. i did not like that part of the documentary you didn't enjoy it no because you remember you talking about how like you, you did. i did your personal side, yeah. how like you liked the the personal stuff, but you also like the, the political stuff. But there was also this fight with you with like, oh, you're on the Ricky Gervais side, like all you celebrities, you know, go f yourselves. But on yeah. the other side, you're like, no, if you have a platform, you should like use it, like make change and stuff. Yeah, I'm like somewhere in the middle too, yeah. but I slightly lean towards Ricky, <laughs> Ricky Gervais. Sure, it's like sure, I, it's for, I understand. I didn't get that. For example. Um, when she was like, okay, <laughs> I'm not going here. Um, okay. <laughs> go ahead. I'm trying to say it's the nicest way possible. So she like had like a meeting with her PR team, like talking about like, oh, I should like say these things. Like I want to be like, spoken about these issues. That's when she's sitting on the couches. And yeah. Speaking to it. Yeah. But in like tra- a dressing room or something like that. You're right. Yeah. yeah. But then they transitioned to her, um, like getting raised in like a tweet like endorsing the, the democratic nominee for tennessee right yeah but like they made it like the biggest deal in the world that she was sending out a tweet oh, yeah. like you know what i mean like they spent like literally 10 minutes on that shot yeah. of her getting raised in a tweet and how scary i was i'm like they, there was a lot of build up to that really I over a tweet yeah Think, but like really? think, think about it. Like but, people are yeah. people are super passionate about their political views, and they're super passionate about Taylor Swift. I get it, but it's a tweet. Yeah. But, no, but that's the thing, though. Like, I agree with you, but also, really, like, no, but also, like, she has like a professional team of people to like. She has a security team, and they were legitimately yeah. scared for her well being, and had paid for what was bulletproof it? vehicles. No. I'm not. I'm and, not denying any of that. And like, obviously, they have to take precautions because she's a hugely valuable asset. <laughs> she's worth a ton of money, like economically. Obviously, that, that's not the other thing. Yeah. But like, um, no, it is. She is. I didn't. Yeah, she yeah, is. yeah. She is. she is. And like, that's how they're employed and stuff. But like, that's the only way that they would need to get those things is if she ended up tweeting about it. Mm-hmm. But it is ridiculous, though. It is ridiculous. It's like because it's not. It's so dis. It's disconnected from how we, you know, yeah. The person. I just thought that was. Yeah, I didn't like that. But then when she was like on the plane and she was like so upset that like the election didn't go the way she wanted to. Yeah. I'm like, if you're really like that shocked and like, that surprised and that sad over it, clearly you're out of touch with your own people. Mm-hmm. Like yeah. if that election didn't go the way you thought it was going to go and you were so shocked by it, mm-hmm. clearly you need to go back to your home state and like actually connect with the people there. 
Because right. at least cause maybe you don't know all the issues like you think you do. It's possible. But yeah, I, I, like I said, she's, like, she seemed like she had done research on it. She is. She 100% did. Yeah. Yeah. You can't just speak out like that and not do research on it. I don't know. But. I don't know if I agree with that. It is tricky though because it's like. But she was like so surprised by it. I'm like, yeah. if you're so surprised, clearly you weren't there talking with people about the actual issues and actual stuff that's going on at hand. Right. You're not there every day. You're not there, you know, yeah. living a nine to five life. Yeah. You know, working for forty thousand dollars a year in Tennessee. I think with the experiences that she's had with like yeah. sexual harassment, sexual assault, stalking mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and being a woman and having experienced some of those myself, mm-hmm. I felt and understood everything she was wanting to fight for. Mm-hmm. And I think that's why it's different. Is yeah. because like the way that she was speaking about it, I didn't care if there was like a ton of research that went into it. It mattered to me that there was someone who didn't care about those things that was getting elected right. in a state that's thousands of miles away from me didn't right. matter. It was that there's women that are going to be there that are going to feel unsafe and unprotected. And right. I think that's kind of where that was coming from. For sure. I'm sure. My thing is like, I don't know. I'm, I'm For me to say like, that person who got elected didn't care. Like, I'm taking yeah. her word for it. Yeah. So, like, maybe not. And part of it's, like, if you actually do care, then you should communicate it really fucking clearly that you care about those issues. So yeah. that, that it, like, you're actually mm-hmm. showing that to the people that would be potentially voting for you. So, like, sure. even that's a big step. But sure, yeah. That's my only thing. It's, like, the only input that I'm even hearing about is just from her one person who doesn't like it. It was messy. It, yeah. It was messy. It's just, like, blanket statement. It was messy. Yeah. Yeah. Back with her, um, with Taylor's like sexual assault case with that um, radio host, DJ, or whatever. Yes. We didn't actually hear from her about that case. So I thought it was really interesting to like actually like hear for the first time, like her take on the situation, everything mm-hmm. that's going on. And Did how, you guys like, heard about that before the documentary? Yes. Yeah, it was like a big news story. It was huge. I didn't but she that. never gave her own like personal, wow. like, she never gave a blanket statement. Like, mm. she said, this is what happened, but she never said, like how it made her feel, well, anything yeah. like that. So I think it was really. Um, and that happened years ago, right? Twenty seventeen. Yeah, oh, a couple so years that's ago. Not that long ago. Or no, it was like no, it was no. A she was while younger. Ago. She was like twenty sixteen, twenty fifteen. Yeah, younger. it was a while ago. Jeez. The court case happened in twenty seventeen. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. So I'm glad that she like got to say her two cents on that and like kind of put a button. In that, I mean, yeah, I just think it's cool. Like she like was brave to like talk about that situation because that's so hard to talk about yeah i can't even imagine what that's like to address that and put on a documentary for the world to see so Ugh, the guy who assaulted her his last name is the same as mine and now i need to change my last name <laughs> <laughs> <Really>? yeah Oof. Oof. <laughs> i need to i need to go change my last name right now <laughs> Did you guys listen to the the Only the Young or Young or whatever that song is? Yes. No. At the end? I was so frustrated and I didn't. <laughs> did. bother. No, I was just going to say that, you know, I was like the one Joel Little did all mm-hmm. the, the, I was like, I was looking, because it wasn't on the original album, I'm like. No, it wasn't. This, and I was like, I'm like, I bet Joel did this one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was, that like, was right. He did. <laughs> <laughs> no way. I totally called no. it. I was like, he just has that power. He, like, when they meet up, they, they do something. It's crazy. Yeah. Also, this is very random. Um, I had cats when I was little. Um, I'm not a huge cat How? person. My, In my, that house? Yeah, believe it. My dad has a lot of allergies. Okay. When I was growing up, like, no legumes, nuts. Got it. You can't have a peanut within, a, like, 100 yards of him. Yeah, and the only al- oh, animals you can have. now I want peanut have. butter. <laughs> wow, that hit fast. <laughs> 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 it was super bad. <laughs> But like, and then the only pets you could have were like hypoallergenic ones, but. Yeah, we anyways. only had hypoallergenic pets in my house growing oh, really? up too, so I get it, yeah. yeah. Yeah, but I thought it was kind of funny to see her cat walking around on the piano and stuff. It reminded me of the Aristocats Disney movie. Cute, yeah. yes. And also when she was walking maybe off the airplane and she yeah, had that. Yeah, and she had the backpack. Yeah, it looked like a submarine or something. Yeah, like, that's, really cool. you have you ever yeah. seen that before? You've never seen that before? No, never. Oh my God, it's this really weird, like popular fad that oh. goes on in california is people oh. walk around with their pets yeah. well the, now i like it less i thought it was on like the a boardwalk thing. yeah now i know it's their, like a thing with their I'm cats kinda... in these backpacks and then mm. they take them out and they put them on leashes and they let them walk around and i'm like it's a cat it belongs in your home it's not a dog <laughs> yeah 
Yeah. Now that... Well, now I don't like it. Yeah. No, because I'm sorry. <laughs> Cause I remember seeing it. I was like, oh, that's really dope. Like, no, she got it's that. It's better to know. Yeah, but now it's like a thing that people do. I'm like, oh. Damn. You guys have not seen that before. No. That's no. hilarious. I'm going to look it up for you. Cat backpacks. Yeah. I thought it was just like Taylor Swift like being cool. And now it's like, oh, yeah. this is being, being people do in California because they're Californians and think they're bougie. Damn. <sighs> Damn. This is just, I feel like I'm growing up right now. That like kind of bummed me out a little bit now. <laughs> so the first thing. I'm glad you noticed it too. <laughs> the first thing That's on hilarious. Google. We both, I don't know if you felt that too, but we were both like, cool. Yeah. <laughs> we don't have cats. Yeah. Oh, Here yeah, you go. That's it. Yeah, yeah, so this yeah. was the second Google result was cat backpacks. Oh, wow. What's that one in the middle? The Whoa. first one was Taylor Swift cat backpack. Okay. The second one was See, cat backpacks. See, it's hot. It's trending right now. It now, really is. I don't like this. Up? See, no. You I, know my stance on animals. Do I? Yeah, you, uh, you should. Eat them? I don't know. That's oh, part wow. of it. Wow. <laughs> I don't know what your stance is. How I think pets are like the weirdest concept in the world. They are pretty weird. Really? Domestic, you feel domestic? that way? Domesticated animals? Yeah. Strange. What what what's going on here? I one hundred percent love it because they you can cuddle them. I grew up in an Ethiopian household where like So that's different. Pets aren't like a a a thing. thing. It's not an idea, it's not a concept. But yeah, no, like pets are like always been like a foreign idea. Sure. Like I don't know. Like the idea of like having an animal in your house. Like Yeah. Why? When I, yeah, when I was overseas, it was like everyone's animals were outside yeah. or you didn't have animals at Yeah, all. exactly. Is it, a, how, how is it a more distinctly American thing to have pets? Well, 100%. One billion percent. Yeah. Like strictly American. Was it like royalty and then Americans? Yeah. 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 <laughs> That's exactly what it was. Yeah. Really? Wow. I guess I never really thought about that. Yeah. I'm just thinking of like owning tigers and like. I wonder if, and, it's, uh, if, if Americans peacocks. were like, hey, royal people like royalty does this so i want to feel like royalty so i'm gonna have a domesticated animal boom that's yeah. probably what the thought process yeah, was probably it's like oh yeah. rich and rich people do this so yeah. if i want to seem like i'm rich i probably have to do this fair the only other way i could see it would, would be for like hunting or like house protection so i could that's see it. like i could see a dog be going farther back I that's the reason why i need an animal right why else like would you have an animal like eating mice around the house i could see that but, but why else would you have an animal in the house? That makes more sense for like barnyard stuff. That's fair. Yeah. That's fair. Can you help can you help me explain like I had a whole conversation with this with um some of the funny enough, some of the parents of the kids I coach about this for like a whole two hours. Okay. I don't understand the idea of like why would you want to have a dog or a cat? Wait, why would you? Yeah. What? I'm so offended by that thought. <laughs> but like why like why do you why do you need an animal in your home because they're so fun and playful but you have to like expend like energy and time yeah. to take care of it yeah it's nice have you ever had a pet i had a goldfish on three but i killed it see that's you can't bond with the fish so it's also my like, grandma had a parrot <clears throat> that's also hard to bond but i rarely ever saw it it's yeah. also a love language thing mm. what do you mean do you know what the five love languages are? We're yeah. totally off topic. Yeah. But the <laughs> mine's physical touch. Yeah. If you had a dog or a cat, one hundred percent would feel your physical touch. Base. But it's not human. It doesn't so what matter. Do I care? It doesn't matter. You don't have to seduce it. You can just <laughs> But I eat animals. I don't eat humans. <laughs> you don't eat some animal. You eat a few animals. I'll eat any animal. Do you eat dogs? I would try dogs if it was served to me. Oh my god. That is horrible. I have no issue with that. If I was traveling if I was traveling and some wonderful person offered me a dog skewer, I would Why not? Try it. What's the I don't understand this issue. Think of like a little puppy dog looking up at you and you're just gonna eat it. Can't wait to fry it up. See <laughs> well, I, I gotta go. Yeah. <laughs> this is gonna be I don't understand the issue here. <laughs> I because here okay, story time. I was in Ethiopia a few years ago with my family visiting uh, the orphanage that my dad has, right? Okay. We were playing with the kids. My parents, they go in the city, buy a lamb. Oh, yeah. Bring the lamb back to the, to the, to the house. Kids are playing with it. They gave it a name, everything. They were, you know, they put a little funny hat on it. They were having fun with the pet. Great, great afternoon, right? My dad says, guys, it's time for dinner. Wash up, you know, get ready for dinner. So said, bye, lamb. <clears throat> bye, lamb. We'll see you later. And then they wash up, and but they, they, I don't know what's going on. I, I'm oblivious, right? Take the lamb, they walk it over by a tree, start tying up the legs. I'm like, 
What's going on here? <laughs> What's going on here? To tie a long rope to to his legs, yeah. wrap around the branch of the tree. Sure. Hang up the tree, lay him upside down. I'm like, no. The kids come out and they're like, they're like, okay, we'll see you then. Bye bye. They're like, they're just, like, they're just chilling there, you know, yeah. watching this all go down. Yeah. And I got, see this guy take out a machete, just. It's hardcore. So it's just, it's just the thing's throat. It bleeds out for like 10 minutes. Just constant g- gushing of blood. That's, kids that's are just disgusting. hanging out there. But yeah. like, that's my whole thing though. It's like, these kids are, could like play with the lamb, enjoy it, have fun with it. But at the same time, understand like, oh, this is also food. Yeah. That happened to Why me can't you white people understand the same thing with dogs? Too. Yeah. We had chickens when I lived in Swaziland. Yeah. And one day, one of the chickens was gone. Oh, damn. Yeah. But like, why you're can't? Your <laughs> but why can't? It was so sad. I was so upset. But like, that's so what I'm saying. Why are white people so upset over that? But then like, a because little kid in Ethiopia is like, because of the way, the way that our culture has raised us is completely different. Yeah, we're totally disconnected from I it. I guess. Yeah. Is this is really that's it. This is a cultural thing. Is that all it is? One thousand percent. Yeah. And I think this I would... might be an overgeneralization, but I feel like there's a lot of white vegans <laughs> i feel like that might be like a natural progression of that yeah it absolutely is and like being disconnected from it yeah not that that's good or bad or i'm just saying that's probably part of the reason i think what kind of dog i try and what kind of dog <laughs> this has gotten so dark do we want it's like dark to you it's not dark to me that's fair do we want to take a quick break and then talk the justin bieber stuff yep we'll sure. talk let's talk bieber and we'll wrap it up okay cool uh, guys, thank you for listening to that conversation. Um, I hope you guys enjoyed it as much as we did. For sure. Yeah, great time. Um, if you want to reach out to us on our email, thecookandthecoachpod at gmail.com. If you want to reach out to us on Instagram, it's pod at, at cookandthecoach. And then Twitter is the cook and the C1, number one, uh, at Twitter. You can find me. At Beza, B A E Z A, Tinsaya, T E N S E I E, on Instagram. Ken? On Instagram, K P Martin 2, K P M A R T I N 2. Uh, you can also listen to my music. It's on Spotify, Apple Music, SoundCloud. Um, the EP is called Bucket List. And yeah. Guys, thank you so much for listening. Uh, we will see you next week with our part two conversation with Taylor about uh, beebs and changes. So stay tuned for that. So long, farewell.